Welcome to today's webinar titled Writing a Case Report, Reporting the Case, What to Leave In and What to Take Out with Dr. Karen Boulanger. Uh, Gerilyn Cambrin, the President-Elect of the Massage Therapy Foundation, will also be joining us. She's been narrating the series, so I'll introduce her and then she in turn will introduce Karen. This is the third webinar in a series that we're doing with the Massage Therapy Foundation on writing case reports. We have recorded the previous ones and if you missed the introduction in the beginning, I'll show you how to watch those um, recorded ones. But let's go ahead and introduce Gerilyn. She is a professor in the Department of Research at the National University of Health Sciences. Her focus is on complementary and alternative medicine research, that's CAM for short, and also evidence-based practice. She has been involved in CAM research for 25 years and has published extensively in scientific literature. As I said, she is currently the president-elect of the Massage Therapy Foundation. We're very excited to have her back. Welcome, Gerilyn. Thanks, Brian. And once again, thank you to ABMP for this wonderful collaborative effort with the Massage Therapy Foundation. Uh, as you stated, this is a five-part series on how to write case reports. And you'll see here that the first session was just the basics on how to write a case report, such as how do you choose a case and what types of things you need to consider before you ever start writing. Last week we had the second session, and that was with Ruth Warner, the president of the Massage Therapy Foundation. And she talked about the introduction and the discussion sections. So with the introduction section, this is part of the case report, which kind of, um, it's like the, the opening scene of a play. It's, it's kind of setting the stage, setting the background, uh, making sure that the reader understands where this case fits into the literature. And in a case report, there's different sections, so the introduction is first, then there's the actual case or the case report, and then there's the discussion section. And the discussion section Ruth also spoke about, and that um, kind of gives a broader view as to how does this case then fit into the bigger picture. So Ruth did a wonderful job with that. Uh, both the first and second sessions are already online and free for people to uh, go back and listen to in case you've uh, missed it. And today we're talking about that middle section, the actual report, how do you write the case part. Um, but let's first take a quick poll. We could switch to the next slide, please. So this poll is, did you view session two regarding how to write the introduction and discussion sections? Great. So go ahead and answer yes or no. You just click on your screen there. And then I will close the poll and share the results. OK, we've got 70% voted. Thank you so much. I'm going to share the results. And Karen, uh, 62, and Gerilyn, 62% said yes, they did watch last week, and 38% are brand new. So welcome. Excellent. Well, welcome back, 62%. We're so happy to have you again. If we could switch to the next slide, please. Um, and for the rest of you who are new to this, a big welcome to you. Uh, even though you haven't seen uh, last week's, hopefully you'll be able to go back and, and listen to that. But I think that this week is just such an essential component, obviously, to writing a case report. So Karen Boulanger is going to talk about how do you actually describe the client. What do you leave in? What do you leave out? What exactly do you have to say about the client? How do you describe them? How do you describe the intervention or the massage that you provided? How do you describe the assessments you used? How do you even choose assessments? And, and then what happened? So she's, Karen's a great person to be doing this. She is currently the practice section editor of the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work, IJTMB.org. And she has been promoted. So as of March 1st, she's been promoted to editor-in-chief. So she is just a wonderful person to be talking about this. Um, as the practice section editor, which is what she's done for a couple of years now, um, she worked with massage therapists who submitted case reports in helping them to revise and refine the product that they did submit. So um, we're really happy to have Karen work with us. Uh, she is also a practicing uh, massage therapist. She has her own practice and she works in hospital-based massage, working at Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. So I think Karen is going to do a wonderful job today. So welcome, Karen, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you all for connecting with me today. <clears throat> 
Before I begin, I just wanted to share with you why I have a PhD, and that is over a decade ago I was a massage therapist and a massage therapy educator. My clients and students had a lot of questions and I felt like I had few answers. At that time I was also working at a chiropractic research center. And it became clear to me that if I wanted to choose the research questions that matter to me and to my clients, I was going to have to go and get a PhD. It also became clear to me that I was going to have to learn how to write, and to write pretty well. So now I still get to provide care to adults and children full time, and I get to be the boss of the research questions. And right now I just wanted to invite you to do something with me. I want you to think about one of the best client experiences that you've ever had one that makes you really proud and really remember how great it was to work with that client. But guess what? The world will tell you that that never happened. It never happened because you didn't write it down. And that's why we all need how to learn to write and to write well. And writing a case report is one of the closest things that you'll ever do to help massage therapists, like all of us, have a say on what the important clinical questions might be. And this brings us one step closer to knowledge that hopefully helps our clients. So on that note, let's get to it. So today we're going to learn how to prepare the methods and the results sections of a case report. We're going to learn how to describe the client, the specific intervention, the massage technique, the assessments used, and the results of the treatment. We're going to determine the best measurements to use and how to appropriately present the results. So I just wanted to uh, give you my thoughts on why I think case reports are important. They describe the breadth of our practice. Um, I'm sure, um, like me, some of you don't just do sweetest massage. You might do neuromuscular, craniosacral, or deep tissue, or myofascial release. And writing up a case report really gives the world a good understanding of all the different things that we do. It's also a dialogue designed to improve client care. We get to talk about what we did with our client. And this is what I think is one of the most important things that I alluded to in the beginning, is that case reports help to identify relevant variables for researchers to investigate. It's how, like I said, we get to have a say on what the researchers um, investigate. And it's also important to know what case reports don't do. They do not establish cause and effect relationships between interventions and outcomes. They do not prove anything. They, but they are a great description of clinical practice. Now, the very first section in the methods is called the profile of the client. And this process in the methods also parallels other professions. So chiropractors, physical therapists, other different types of people who provide service um, also follow the same format when they write the profile of the client. So here's a list of things that you want to be including in this section. So client demographics, such as age and gender, medical history, and also some social history, like what their occupation is, their diagnosis, who made the diagnosis, when it was made, and how was it made, what tests um, were conducted. And then you also want to talk about prior recommendations, treatments, and outcomes. So for example, if it's somebody who's had low back pain, you want to know what their doctor or any other care providers told them to do, what the treatment were, and how did they fare with those treatments? Were they helpful? Were they not so helpful? Were they harmful? You really want to have a good sense of what the client has been through before they came to see you. Here's an example of a profile of a client, and this was in a case report that was published in IJTMB. And I'm just going to kind of read this quickly, but I want you to get a sense of how you can kind of start to um, tell the story. The client is a 5 foot 10 inch, 145 pound, 25 year old female with symptomatic Morton's neuroma between the third and fourth metatarsals in her left foot is diagnosed by her trauma doctor after x-rays to exclude a foot fracture. The client is physically active. She's an avid runner, swimmer, and biker who exercises four to six times per week. She competes in running races ranging in length from 5k to 12k. She considers her job to be stressful and she typically exercises for stress reduction. At the time of starting the massage therapy treatments, she had been unable to run for the three months prior due to pain. Her job requires many hours on her feet, setting up outdoor research projects and lifting heavy objects. 
and this continues on to talk about upon diagnosis with Morton's neuroma, the client's physician recommended rest, one month with no exercise, and a cortisone injection. The client complied by receiving the shot and ceasing running, but was unable to be off her feet at work. After one month of inactivity and the cortisone shot, the pain had lessened slightly, but was still persistent, both during activity and while resting. And you can kind of just get a, a sense of, you know, the rest of that. I don't want to read all of that for you. But I wanted you to have a good example of what a profile of a client would look like. You also want to talk about current symptoms. You really want to have a sense of how does this condition affect their activities of daily living? So are they not able to run? Are they not able to play with their children? And then you also want to talk about the client's desired outcomes. And what's helpful is for people to understand that it's not just what the providers want for the clients, but that what's important for the client. So for example, maybe they really want to be able to walk to the store or um, a variety of things. And one of the things that you can do too is, and I always recommend this to people, is to read other examples of case reports so that you can get a sense of how people kind of capture some of these more creative things. The other thing that you can look at examples of are pictures. So, exam for, so for example, if there was um, a, a fracture or an injury and there's an MRI picture or an x-ray picture or a illustration of the anatomy that's involved, it's kind of nice to have uh, those things included as well. And this gives you um, an example of some of the massage therapy assessment and what that looks like in written form. And you can see at the very end there the client's goal. The client's stated goal for the sessions was to find relief from the Morton's neuroma pain and to return to her physically active lifestyle. And so now, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you for the poll. Okay, great. Sorry, I had a little um, mute issue there. So let me go ahead and launch the poll. And the question is, are your progress notes, I'm assuming that's the poll, I missed this slide, Karen correct me if I'm uh, wrong, are your progress notes complete enough for you to write a profile of a client? So the answers are, the options are yes, my progress notes are very complete, no, my progress notes could use more detail, or I don't write progress notes. So please go ahead and vote. And in the meantime, while people are voting, Karen, I'm going to invite you, uh, Jack has emailed a question in, what makes it a good client profile. So you talked about what to include, but what makes it a really good one? So hold on, and I'm going to close the poll, share the results. So Karen, 29% of the people said yes, my progress notes are very complete. 62% said no, my progress notes could use more detail. And 9% said I don't write progress notes. Okay. So getting back um, to that other question is basically what makes a good profile of a client is you want to introduce the client and all the information about them that is relevant to the case. You know, you, you want to leave out details that don't pertain to the case and you, you certainly want to leave out any identifying information. And it should also, you're, you know, you're building a story of, you know, this is the client, this is how they came to me, um, this is all the information that we have gathered, and then it should also kind of follow in logical consequence that, you know, the next thing that we're going to talk about is, you know, the intervention and the assessment, and you want people to be able to follow along with you, like, oh, given everything that we know about this client, what's the next step? Like, what are the things that we kind of have to hold in our mind when we're uh, designing the next piece that we're going to talk about the treatment plan and the intervention. So hopefully that answered your question. So like I said, the second part of um, the method section is a treatment plan. So given everything we know about this client, what is our initial plan for how we're going to intervene? So some people elect to describe the intervention 
in detail using a table, and I have ex I have an example of that uh, upcoming for you shortly, and I think that's a helpful way to organize that information. And some people wonder, well, how much detail is needed? What what do we really need to say? And the common answer is this: that you want to be able to describe it in enough detail that someone else could also provide that same intervention to see if they got a similar or different result. This information also wants to be included. The duration of the sessions, were they 30-minute sessions, 60-minute sessions, the type of strokes that were used, and this is when you want to use common language, um, body regions, where were those strokes applied, the number of sessions, and it's been mentioned before that you can have one session with someone and write a case report, or you can have a number of sessions, and you just want to be really clear about what you did. And as I mentioned, you want this to be in enough detail that if your protocol leads to good outcomes, or not, of course, um, that it could be repeated by a peer, that's someone else. You also, in this section, want to give a rationale for the techniques that you chose. And here you want to make distinctions between techniques that were based on evidence. So, for example, maybe there was a randomized controlled trial that suggested that Swedish massage was uh, very helpful for low back pain. And so that would be a rationale um, for using Swedish massage. Uh, for back pain if that's what your client was having, versus those that were due to clinical opinion. Like we know this really, really hasn't been tried or it hasn't been written, so we don't know. But based on my clinical experience, I'm choosing to use this particular technique for this particular client to achieve this particular result. And as promised, here's an example of a general treatment plan outline. Um, I, I really like this because I think you, you get a sense of the area, the technique that was done, the muscles that were in, involved, and then any other relevant comments. And this is from a case report that was also published in IJTMB. So you have it here. If you want to go back and read the initial article, um, you can do that as well. And then the next section for the methods is the treatment plan assessment portion. So here, um, Organization is really important because you're going to have a lot of things that you're going to talk about because massage therapists typically do an initial assessment and then they assess as they're going along and then they assess maybe after the massage or after a series of massages and a final assessment. And so all this assessing <laughs> can get kind of confusing and so I think using uh, subheadings for each type of assessment can be really helpful. You want to make your case report easy for the reader. Um, definitely for the reviewer initially who's looking at the paper, you want them to follow along in some logical consequence. And then you want to use these same subheadings in the results section to organize the findings that you are reporting. So for example, if you say I measured this first, this second, this third, then in the results you would present the results of each one of those um, assessments in that same order. And when we're looking at assessment, there's lots of different things that you want to mention. You want to, for example, say, what did you measure? So say we measured pain, as an example. Why did you choose your measure? Well, because the patient came in, they were reporting pain, and um, one of the client's desired outcomes was to decrease their pain. How did you measure it? And we're going to talk a little bit more like that, because I'm going to continue to use pain as an example, because I think it's a common symptom that we all see in our practice. And where did you measure it? And in, in some cases with pain, this may or may not make sense unless you're saying, oh, we were specifically talking about the low back pain. But if it's something like range of motion, you want to talk about, you know, where did you measure the range of motion? And when did you measure it? Was it before the massage, after the massage, just at the beginning, just at the end? You want to give a sense of um, when exactly you did these assessments. And a little bit about outcome measures, and this is kind of research language, so it's just basically an assessment that you do to measure the effect of what you've done. So that's an outcome measure. And the first thing that I'd like to say about this is please don't create your own. Um, there are so many different types of outcome measures out there. I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. 
And if you want to know the effort that goes into creating a new measure or a new scale, um, I, I invite you to look at my article that was in the last September issue of iGen TV. Um, creating a measure um, is a very lengthy process. You need to demonstrate reliability and validity. And it's a very complicated thing. And because um, there's so many that are already out there, um, in, unless there's something very specific that you want to measure, and in this case it was client expectations of massage, I thought that was an important variable that needed its own scale, so I developed one. But um, in the most case, there's a lot of resources out there that are available to you. So that you have lots of choices. And then Brian, um, you are next up for a poll to ask people whether or not they use outcome measures in a consistent manner in their practice already. Okay, fantastic. So let me go ahead and launch that. Do you use outcome measures in a consistent manner? Just go ahead and answer yes or no. We'll wait for you to go ahead and uh, respond to that. And for those of you that are emailing in and asking about the slides, I did send those yesterday, but I am happy to resend those. I will review how to access them at the end of the webinar, um, but you can also send me your email address. B-R-I-A-N at abmp.com and I'll send those to you. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Let me share the results. And 41% said yes and 59% said no. That is excellent. Um, I, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, I, know, I know that in, in my practice, oftentimes I'll be really good about using outcome measures if it's someone who's had an injury and they're going to be you know, I have to be accountable to an insurance provider or a workman's comp person or something like that. Um, but I'm so glad to hear that um, so many people are using them. That's awesome. So here is what I would say is the best resource for all of us. It's the InCam Outcomes Database. It's an excellent resource that can assist you in choosing an appropriate outcome measure. And it's free and it's accessible. Here is the website. And this is one of the uh, graphics you'll see. And what I like about this is that it really talks about different frameworks um, for outcome domains. So for example, there's contextual effects like relationship issues, um, things that measure process. Quality of life is um, really, there's <laughs> lots, so many things about quality of life, I guess, is, is what I want to say. And, um, and then all the different aspects like social, physical, spiritual, psychological. So for example, um, if you want to measure um, things like depression or affect and mood and uh, things like that. And it's fully searchable. So you could go in there, for example, and say, again, you want to measure pain, you can just put in the little search box pane and it'll come up and give you all the information. It will also give you the um, reference for um, the validity and reliability testing and if there's other articles that use that particular scale or outcome measure, they'll give you references for that as well. And um, if there's a link to it, they'll give you that. If you have to charge for it, they'll tell you that. So there's so much information, and that's where I would really recommend most people go is uh, go to the database and see. And one of the other things that um, you should take into consideration when you are choosing an outcome measure is how do most people measure this? So for pain and massage therapy, it's usually a visual analog scale or a, num a numeric rating scale for pain or for anxiety, you know, there's a Spielberger state trade anxiety scale. We see that a lot in massage therapy research. So one of the things that's good about using a standardized instrument in your assessment is that you can kind of compare the value of your client to some other standard. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that um, for pain. So here's a common example. It's a numeric rating scale for pain. It measures the severity of pain using just one item, so it's very quick and easy. Um, it's free to use. There's no cost to you. And it's easy and quick to administer. And here's um, what one might look like. And so the client would choose what their level of pain is, 0 to 10, and they can strike a line or um, when I used it, there was a box above each number, and then they check mark the box. There's lots of different varieties of these that you will see.
And one of the things that's also helpful is you have to, you know, like I said, you have to describe all your different assessments. And here's what a description might look like. And this is the kind of information that you want to be including on any outcome measure that you use. So the numeric rating scale for pain consists of 11 numbers ranging from 0 to 10 displayed horizontally, anchored on the left with no pain, and on the right with worst pain possible. Clients were asked to check the box that corresponds to their level of pain. And NRSP was used pre and post massage in a previous study that detected significant changes in postoperative patients. The validity and reliability of this type of rating scale has been supported, and two point changes have been considered clinically important in previous studies. So I think most of you know that in case reports we don't talk about statistically significant differences and things like that, but what you could talk about is if, for example, your client experienced a three-point change in their pain, you could, you could say and reference these studies that that you know, type of pain reduction, hopefully, is considered clinically important and has been seen in other studies. So you take the results that your client achieved and then you put them in a context and you can then compare them to other changes in either similar um, samples of people, whether they're massage therapy clients or other clients from different pro professions if it's not something really common like pain. And so off to the results again. Um, you don't want to have any um, raw data in the results. It's really like a summary of measurements. You want to present the results of each measure in the same order as you describe them in the methods section. So in the methods I told you to kind of organize all of your assessments together in some logical order and then when you present the results you want to use that same structure. And so what I mean by no raw data in the text is you don't say like in sentence form in a paragraph oh, on the first day their pain was a one, and then it was a this, and then a that. You, tables and graphs are much more useful and tell your story um, much better. And you want to state the facts. You don't make any interpretations about the data. You save that for the discussion section. So you're just stating the facts. And <laughs> Um, in the results, you want to uh, be prepared. So before you design your table or graph, read the directions and follow the directions. So when you are writing your case report, you really want to have in mind what journal you plan on submitting it to. And they will have very specific examples of um, things that they want you to include. And I'm certainly not going to read this to you, but it is proof that these directions do exist. And um, they're, they're quite extensive. And you really want to read them very carefully before you write the table so then you don't have to redo your work. And then there's also directions for figures. So if you're using a graph, that would be a figure. If you're using a picture, that would be a figure. And again, you want to read these instructions, and you want to follow them. And here's an example of um, a, a pain figure here. And this was taken from a case report from IJTMB. And so lots of things that you want to have in a table. So for example, you want to have a title that is a good description of, of what the person is looking at. And on the left, you can see that it's pain level from a 0 to 10 scale. On the very bottom, looks like this client had nine different sessions. And by the different um, colors of green, you can tell what was before and what was after. And in case the numbers on the left weren't good enough for you, this person actually even um, individually labeled um, all the bars. Now, this particular table is pretty good because it has a lot of the things in there. And there's one thing about this table that apparently I didn't catch at the time. And as I was looking for a good example of something nearly perfect um, that I found. And this one isn't too bad, but sometimes uh, this can get really out of hand. And that is, if you haven't found it already, on the very far left, you see that the potential ranges of the values of pain were 0 to 10, and because it, it tells you that underneath that. But yet, the range of the values that are actually shown to you on this graph are only from 0 till 8. And so ideally, it should have showed 0 to 10 because then it makes the bars and the changes between the bars, they can just be off balance. And, and you can do this. See, I think 
a lot of the software that creates these is that they um, they put the numbers in there for you automatically and you have to with intention go in there and then adjust the range of the values from 0 to 10 and then if you do that and kind of play around with that you'll see what I mean so the big the uh, the bars can look, the differences between the bars can look a little bit more exaggerated when you don't have the full range in there. So you can kind of play with that when you're creating one of your own figures someday. But, but in general, this is, a, this is a nearly perfect illustration, and it kind of tells you the story. You can kind of get a sense of, gee, by you know, session six, this person was feeling pretty good. They didn't have any vein, and you know, that carried on for the, the remainder of the session. So it's a good table. And here's another one that, um, this is a lot of information, but I think that because it's organized so well that you can, you know, look at it without getting too dizzy. And you can see that across five sessions, uh, range of motion was measured before and after, and we had active range of motion, passive range of motion, and then underneath the table you have explanations for what WNL within normal limits means, and um, all those different kind of things. And again, this was a case report in IJTMB, so you can look at the full case report if you're interested in how this person, for example, described um, what they did in the methods and described what they did in the results and how this table kind of fits in. I think um, before you write a, uh, write a case report, definitely, definitely read uh, other examples. I think that really does a lot of the work for you. So the one thing I just wanted to remind you is, I'm sure you've heard me say this over and over again, that uh, case reports do not prove cause and effect relationships. They're really good at describing a case and telling a clinical story, but just because one person um, obtained a beneficial result does not mean that other people will. And uh, just kind of cautionary tale there. And before you submit your case report, for publication. I just have some advice for you. The first one is to read your case report out loud. This is really helpful for finding typos that um, other people might not have caught. And ask another massage therapist to read it. And you know, you have the value here of someone who shares the context and knowledge and maybe same skill set as you. And when you have a story in your mind, and you then have to put that story onto paper, you know, there's a little challenge, and I'm always having this challenge, is because, well, I did it, so I know, so if I left something out, it's hard for me to catch it. But if somebody else reads it, then they'll be like, oh, but you did talk about this, or, like, I even had a case report that was submitted that, uh, you know, they forgot to say what the gender of the client was. Well, that's because they know, and they just forgot to write it down. So a lot of these things, um, you know, you know, it's just, um, it's just all in your head, and, and you got to get it back on paper. And having someone else read it will really have those things kind of be brought to light so that you can then add it in. And then ask someone who is great at editing to read it, someone who can really look for things like organization and structure and flow. And then <laughs> my final recommendation is leave it alone, don't look at it for two weeks, and then read it one last time, and then submit it. So here it looks like we've got lots of time for questions, which I, I think is great because um, not knowing exactly where you all are coming from, um, I'd love to entertain questions and uh, have you tell me what maybe I, what I left out and, and did not leave into this presentation. Okay, great. So we definitely had a few um, questions come in. And Karen, while I pull those open, uh, can you describe the picture there? Oh, sure. Yes, that is me and my daughter at my niece's wedding. Very nice. I just, want, I just wanted to end, uh, to begin and end the presentation with smiles, so there you go. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so let's go to the beginning. You talked about assembling uh, information and doing a description. So Brianne is asking about, you talked about doctor's reports as well. She's asking about MRIs and other pictures with your case report. And um, do you need to have the client's written permission in order to use those? And is there permission required to submit the case report if you're obviously not going to use any of their other information, if that makes sense? Right. I think it's um, absolutely the best practice to always um, 
have permission to use any of your client's information, even to write a case report. Some, depending on the journal, they might require um, that you submit permission to them. And, and even for things like if you see a really cool anatomy picture online, you'd also, of course, have to also um, have permission to use that as well. So really, anytime you're using pictures or photographs, no matter where they came from, unless you took it yourself, but if it includes someone's you know, face or something like that, um, absolutely you need to have permission. Okay, great. And is there standard language? Nara wants to know if there's a standard language guide for describing client conditions or assessments. You know, there's lots of uh, resources out there. Um, I think the the best case, I mean, the, the best practice is to go to, say, IJTMB or um, the Journal of Movement and Body Work Therapies and, and, and look at previous case reports that have been published and see how those people did it. It's especially helpful if it's a condition that's in any way related to the condition that you're looking at. So even, for example, um, if you're writing about a condition that no one's really published about yet, you could go to the physical therapy literature, the chiropractic literature, the medical literature, and see if there's case reports about that. I'm, I'm a big fan of having an example in front of you when you're about to go uh, write something. Mm -hmm. And let's just take this opportunity to be a nice plug for IJTMB, especially since you're now promoted to the editor-in-chief. Uh, you talked about directions and you talked about examples of case reports. You, can we just go to IJTMB.org or, uh, or how to, what's the best way to go? Yeah, IJTMB.org is, is the journal's website and there, you know, all the issues are archived and, it, and you know, it's freely accessible to everyone. You don't have to be a subscriber, although you can sign up to have notices of when the new issue comes out be sent to you. And in the practice section is often where case reports um, are put, but there are exceptions to that. Sometimes case reports are also published in the research section. It just depends on um, how the workload is being divvied up, so to speak. Okay, great. So let's see here. Um, Sarah's asking if you could briefly review outcome measures again. Sure. Let me go to my own notes on that. So an outcome measure is a standard, you know, in the most in most cases, it's a standardized tool that people use to measure some sort of phenomena. So for example, um, I use uh, pain, the numeric rating scale for pain. And that's a, a very common one that's used. There's also outcome measures, for example, say one of the symptoms that's important to one of your clients is sleep. That they're not sleeping well, and then they get up in the morning, and then they're cranky, and then they're not performing at work, and then they're not enjoying their life because then when they get home, they're exhausted. Um, so sleep can also be uh, an, an important um, symptom to measure as well. And there's different sleep uh, questionnaires that you can use if that's something that's important. But really when you're deciding on what outcome measure to use, you want to look at what other people have measured. So if um, a medical doctor, say, was, you know, assessing someone's sleep, what measures do they use? Or in other research that's been done on interventions used to improve sleep, what questionnaires have they used? And so you can, do, you know, go on PubMed and do a lit search for um, sleep and measurement and, and see what's been used and see, again, looking for good examples, things that, oh, you know, that person used that outcome measure, that really makes sense. I think that is a good indication of um, how I could measure success with this client and, you know, what I intend to do for them. So you really want to um, choose something that is most relevant to your client and your client's condition and that kind of is a good match for the intervention that you're using. Okay, great. And could you mention the outcome database web address again, please? Sure. Can I scroll back to that? Is that Absolutely. Okay? Sure, sure. The best way to do that. There we go. And, and this is just so amazing. I am so grateful um, that the group of people that put this together put this together because it is just great. Really, everything that 
you need to know about choosing something is pretty much here. It's just an absolutely amazing resource and um, you can kind of go in there and, and, and play around a little bit and see. Okay, yeah, good. And, and they also have a lot of social measures as well, like I alluded to earlier. Um, a lot of people come to massage therapists for pain, but what they also have in addition to that is depression or anxiety. A lot of people who have pain also feel depressed and have issues with anxiety. And although massage therapists, their main intention might not be to treat that depression or to treat that anxiety, it's often observed that in the process of receiving massage therapy that things like anxiety and depression improve. Mm -hmm. So those are good things to track as well. Great. Uh, Karen, Jeremy's asking, is there a limit on how many outcome measures should be used in a case report? Well, I, I wouldn't so much ask the question that way. What I would ask is, is there a limit to the amount of measurements that I would ask my client to participate in? Because <laughs> um, it really, I mean, to me, it's less of a case report issue than um, taking good care of your client issue. So um, for me, I would look at what are the most important things? And, um, and, it, and it really depends on the condition. So if any people have you know, really specific examples of, I have a client with this, um, feel free to let Brian know and he can let me know because um, it really works better when you have something really specific in mind. But you want to have like a primary outcome measure, like maybe it's pain or disability or range of motion, and then you can have secondary measures like um, quality of sleep, mood, um, activities of daily living, you know, whatever is important to the client. And also keeping in mind when other clients present with this condition in other professions, what outcome measures are typically used. So it's kind of like this balancing act of what's important to you, what's important to the client, and what's important to the healthcare community. You have to balance all those things out. But you don't really want, you know, your care to be mostly about outcome measures. You, you know, you want to have a lot of good you know, massage therapy care in there and compassion. You don't want to overburden people um, with assessment. You just want to do what's necessary to really kind of capture and tell a good story. Okay, great. Now, regarding outcome measures and replication, Sean is wanting to know for a modality such as cranial sacral mm -hmm. and the treatment, how do you detail or how much detail do you describe in the report in order to, for it to be replicated by another therapist. How does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, as a craniosacral practitioner myself, I, I understand how um, this could be a particular challenge because there's a, a certain amount of left brain and right brain involved with that. And you might have a plan for doing something some way, and, and, and this is probably true of a lot of other massage techniques as well, is you, know, you come up with an initial plan and then kind of halfway in the middle you'd be like, you know what, the body just doesn't really seem to be re responding to this very well and maybe I need to change gears and do this. And that's absolutely fine if you... Um, deviate from your initial plan, you just want to talk about that in the discussion section. It's just, you know, I, I plan to do this and the person didn't react very well. And you just provide an explanation of your clinical reasoning for, for what happened. But as far as the amount of detail that needs to be included, um, there have been some reports of um, cranial sacral before. So I would go and I would find um, the reports of that and see how other people have done it. Again, <laughs> I keep saying this, but I'm a big fan of seeing how other people have done it. And if they did it well, then you know, use that as an example. If they didn't do it so well, then you know, aim to strive uh, to do better. But you know, there's different positions um, that are used in cranial sacral. That you know, there's a universal language for different locations, like the thoracic inlet or the sacrum. You know, there's things like that that can be described like that. So, you know, you kind of have to be thinking cranial sacral practitioner to cranial sacral practitioner. If you, so say for example, I was treating someone and we were getting really good results and that person moved to a different city and wanted me to talk to that mas massage therapist there. So it's kind of like you think about that level of detail. Like what does that new massage therapist need to know about how I've been treating this client so that hopefully they can continue to get the same outcomes or better? Okay, great. I believe this question kind of dovetails with that. This is from Nara. And she's asking specifically about myofascial release. Um, it, it can mean different things to different people, she's saying. 
depending on who teaches it. Now, how do we clarify our version of a technique is our question. Yeah, you know, that, that's very true. I, I, I hear that. So there was, um, you know, and if my memory serves me, it could have been that she was a physical therapist, that she wrote a case report on myofascial release, and she also had this very same concern. And that was published in IJTMB, and there was definitely myofascial release in the title. So I would send her to read that to see how that particular person did it. But I remember that was also a concern of hers. But in the end, she felt that um, it was represented in a way that was clear and true. Okay, great. To the technique. Karen, Amy's asking, and this is a beautiful lead-in to what we talked about before the webinar started, is there an outline to follow for writing a case report? <laughs> Oh, very good. So there are lots of outlines out there. Um, I have one that I use, and so if you are intending to submit your case report to IJTMB, um, I would definitely recommend using my outline. Often in the beginning, when I'm working with an author, um, I will definitely give them this outline. So I'm going to send the outline that I use to Brian, and then he is going to email it to everyone who has registered so you'll have it and basically then what you'll have is a checklist of what the section editor is looking at and you know you can compare what's in your case report so far to the outline and um, a lot of the checklist for the methods and the results uh, sections I have presented already to you today but there's also um, an outline for the introduction for the discussions and the conclusions and um, other little pieces of helpful information that I've put together after um, researching, you know, what does a great case report look like. But also, um, in Chris Moyer and Trish Dryden's book, there's a chapter that was written on case reports. I think maybe Mike Ham did that. And Martha Menard Brown, in her book, she has um, a chapter on how to write a case report. And I think Geraldine did a series on how to write a good case report, and those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, fantastic. So I will send that to everybody uh, tomorrow morning, and hopefully we'll have the webinar posted by then, the recording posted, and I'll give you a link to the recording as well. Okay, great. So Karen, I have a few more questions here. Um, how important is it to be uh, to be consistent with the results in rating scales. Rosie is asking, like if you're doing a case study series with different symptoms and concerns for each patient, is it okay to use different rating scales for each patient or should you be consistent? Well, I would say if you're having a series of people who are coming in with um, very similar conditions or the same conditions, I would aim for consistency. Um, just because, you know, you're starting now not to be uh, presenting the results for one person, but you have several. And so I would think consistency, as long as it seems clinically appropriate, um, would, be the best, would be the best practice in that case. And we really haven't talked about um, case series so much, and, and that is when, you know, instead of having a case report on one person, that you have several people with a similar condition that you're tracking at the same time, and we call that a case series. And I think in most times, uh, consistency is probably better. But again, you always have to, it's got to be clinically appropriate to do that. Okay, great. Do you have a particular outcome table that you prefer? Hmm. I've given you some examples. Let's see, we did for pain, for a graph, and we did range of motion. I think that range of motion table um, could be helpful for other outcomes as well because it has, you know, the timing, it has the pre-post and it has for each section and then you can kind of kind of tell a story of how things move. I, I think, you know, the, the answer is that is whatever tells the best story because a lot of times um, tables and 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 graphs, that's what you want them to do, is you want the person to be able to look at it. And it's like a picture of what the results are. And it tells a story. And, and you know, you want it to be clear, you want it to be organized and accurate. And, and I, think, um, I think it really just depends. Okay, great. But to look at, I, I would, again, I would, I would look and see other people who have used this particular outcome measure, how did they display the results? What did, you know, what did theirs look like? 
That makes sense. And do you have references, I mean, for any particular software or anything like that for creating scales? Oh, for creating tables? Mm, no. Mm -mm. You, you, I, mean, I mean, a table is probably, I use Microsoft Word, which is uh, what probably most people would be using. But mm -hmm. as far as uh, creating a graph, you could do that in, in PowerPoint and Word. I mean, there's so many different types of software that, could, that you, know, mm -hmm. you can use to do that. Now, Karen, since you're in Silicon Valley, Brian is asking if there are any apps for iPads, et cetera, for case studies or client intake forms. Are you aware of anything? You know, that, that's great, um, and, I, and I wish I knew that, but I don't know. But um, I'm guessing, you know, if you, if you went into the, the App Store and plugged in Case Report or something like that, there might be. But gosh, what a great project for someone. That would be a great project for someone <laughs> to do, is to write an app for massage therapists to write case reports. That would be excellent. But again, you know, it's just it's a, it's a structural thing, but um, that, that 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 could be helpful. But there's just so much room for creativity and and for individuation that, yeah. Anyway, but that was great. I like that one. Okay. Now this uh, case report webinar series is stimulating, folks. It's fantastic, and Merlin is writing in. Okay, so what if you have a client that you've already worked with? and you would like to write a case report. However, you do not record all of the detail, for instance, in range of motion or pain outcomes. How can you backtrack and, and try and piece this together? What do you recommend? Well, you'd have to look at your notes and see what you did have. Um, the, the other thing, too, and, and again, I don't know how much we've talked about this so far, is you know we have been using this language, case reports. There are also case studies, which are more qualitative in nature. So in a case report, we're talking about outcome measures and you know numbers and you know things like that. But case studies also are another way to kind of qualitatively describe um, what has happened, and these, these get a little trickier, and, and they have their own um, own way of being done. But that might also be an option, or you could, you know, do a mixture of both, right? If you just had a, a couple of numbers about a couple of things, you could include that, and then the rest kind of fill in with a very rich description of this is what you know the client presented with. This is kind of um, the progression of of what things look like, and, and tell the story kind of that way. Mm -hmm. And it's also stimulating some questions among folks. Uh, both Cassandra and Jennifer are asking about legal uses of case reports. Uh, specifically, could a case report be used in a court case? And secondly, uh, can they be used for medical insurance? Um, I don't know about court cases. You know, um, I do know Ruth Werner has, has been an expert witness a couple of times. She might be a, a better person to answer that. And case reports, although they are, um, you know, a really nice description of what's going on and they lead to great research hypotheses, they are uh, kind of on the lower end of the evidence pyramid, and so. I don't know, I think it would depend, but uh, I think most people, they'd be like, oh, it's a case report. You know, they're, they're not going to see it as a very high level of evidence. Okay, thank you for that. So Rosie's asking if the study is over multiple sessions over several months, uh, can you reassess every fourth session or every month? What would be the optimal timing uh, to assess, not take up too much of the session time, but still get good mm -hmm. data? Yeah, you know, it's the answer to that is, of course, it depends, it depends, it depends. Um, if there is some logical way that most people practice, um, you, you know, I'm thinking like in PT, right? Like they have very usual like interval assessments and if you could find any, you know, way that someone did something or if there's uh, like a best practice for assessing these things. But this is one of the things that we really need in massage therapy is kind of really having a good understanding of, you know, and it, to answer this question, right, like when is the best time to do these assessments? And so, you know, not having an answer for our particular field specifically, I would, I would go to other fields and say, you know, when are these assessments typically done? I don't think we really have a really good uh, protocol for our profession so much as assessment is concerned. Okay, great. And Karen, could you put up the uh, last slide which would promote the uh, next webinar 
which is March 13th, just so people can see that in case they need to, to there we go, perfect. Okay, great, we'll just leave that up for people to look as we finish these questions. Now, as far as uh, scope of practice, Karen, um, there's a specific question about the use of a goniometer to measure range of motion. Are we okay doing that as massage therapists, or is that stepping on physical therapist's toes? There have been um, other case reports that have been written by massage therapists that have used a uh, goniometer as a measurement. So I wouldn't see why, um, unless there's like, see the thing in massage is, you know, every state is different and every state has different uh, guidelines and scope of practice issues. So um, I think you'd be safest to consult that first. Okay. And if it's, you know, not obvious, then I, I would say go for it. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarity. Uh, wonderful webinar, Karen. Thank you. I hope it explains a lot to folks about what to leave in, what to take out. I think we got through all the questions, and if we did not, uh, Ruth said last week folks can go to massagetherapyfoundation.org. In fact, let me just go ahead and pull that up now, if that's all right. Go ahead and uh, share my screen, and also show you how to um, access the recordings by doing that. So, Gerilyn, if you, I would invite you to come on and talk about the next session while, we, while I pull up that um, Massage Therapy Foundation website. You can introduce Kim. Oh, that sounds great. Um, the next session is about something called research posters. And posters are, um, just like they sound, posters, but they're enlarged pieces of paper with an abstract about a case report on them. Now, typically posters are presented at scientific conferences. Uh, and so if you ever go to a research conference, there's one coming up in Boston, the uh, Massage Therapy uh, Research Conference and we will have a poster session where people can walk around and look at these um, posters and read just a little tidbit about the research that each individual has done. And some of these posters will be about case reports. And so it's, it's a different option. If people don't want to write a whole case report, they can develop a research poster instead. So that's what Kim will be talking about in two weeks. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take back control. Karen, thank you so much for that. That was uh, wonderful. You have a wealth of information, and congratulations on your new position. She may have muted herself. I did. Thank you very much, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thanks again. Um, I'll show you right now if you have additional questions. Let me just make sure you can see my... Screen? Yes, you can. Okay, great. So this is the Massage Therapy Foundation website, massagetherapyfoundation.org. I'm going to show you a couple things here. First of all, if you have additional questions, either for Karen or Ruth or for Gerilyn, in the right-hand corner here, hit Contact Us. So I'm going to click there. It's going to open up. I believe you can send an email. Yes, there's a form here. So fill out your name and your comment and go ahead and send it in and the folks there will distribute uh, as appropriate. All right, so we'll back up one screen. If you want to watch the recordings, there you have two ways to do that. You can go to the Massage Therapy Foundation. Right here, I'm going to click on Writing Case Reports. It's going to open up this description about the five-part series. And you can see the first one right here. We'll just click there, Writing a Case Report. So I'm going to click, and that will open up a viewing screen. All right, so that's a nice, easy way to do it if you'd like to go there. And the reason I'm showing you that somebody wants to say something. Nope. Um, the reason I'm showing you is because also Ruth mentioned last week about a toolbar, and let's see if I can pull that up. I don't, I haven't downloaded it myself, but I highly encourage you to do that. And did I lose my website? I did lose my website. How oh, unfortunate. All right. Anyway, massagetherapyfoundation.org. There's a research tool a toolbar that you can download, so I encourage you to go ahead and do that. The other way to watch the recording is to go to our site, abmp.com, and this will also show you how to get the CE Hour and register for next uh, webinar. I was going to say next week's webinar, but it's actually in two weeks, so make note of that, March 13th. We're going to scroll down. You can click right on the right-hand side here, writing a case report. You see that under upcoming events, or you can click on professional events, webinars, and CE. And I'll just scroll down to the live workshops and webinars under practitioner's calendar, right here under live webinars. We'll click 
and we'll scroll down and you can register for the remaining two webinars in the series by clicking register now here or here and also please preview the upcoming webinars we have a great ser um, mind body series with two Luca. you can register for those webinars right here uh, we'll back up one screen I'll show you how to get the CE hour so if you're an ABMP member you'll be very familiar with this and if you're not no worries I'll show you how to access it we're going to click on learn more under archived webinars that's going to take you to this screen you go ahead and enter your email address to log in and your password and if you're not a member no worries we invite you to go ahead and click right here and create a free account we will access uh, you could be able to access a lot of materials that we offer for free as a service to the profession and also invite you to get to the online education center where you can uh, purchase our webinars and our online courses so by logging in will take us to this online education center we're going to click on view webinars right in the center of the navigation bar here that will open up the webinar library 